The title of this video is misleading. Billy Graham isn't just the Marvel guy. He was a versatile creator who wore a lot of hats during his career. The man was an artist, writer, art director, playwright, actor, set designer, and stuntman. Definitely not someone who limited himself creatively. The guy also had a cool signature. As always, the full transcripts for my essays along with my videos are available on my website, witsandpod.com. This is Billy Graham, by the way, aka The Irreverent One. Born in New York in 1935, Graham graduated from New York City's Music and Art High School before starting at Warren Publishing, a horror-themed comic and magazine publisher. During this time, Graham worked on Creepy, Eerie, and even the first issue of Vampirella, among other titles. Yes, that Vampirella. Graham actually worked on a good bit of the early vampy issues during this time at Warren, among his other responsibilities. Publisher James Warren thought Graham was so versatile that he promoted the artist to art director, which is insane given how early Graham was in his comics career. Jim Warren has a great quote about Graham from a 1998 interview. You have to understand that all Billy wanted to do his whole life was just be Jack Kirby. I said, you'll be the Black Jack Kirby, but not today. Today, you're the art director of Warren Publishing. But he said, I can't art direct. And I said, I'll show you how. There's your office. You now have a full-time job, a paycheck every Friday. Do you accept? And he said, you're goddamn right. And I taught him how to art direct during our slow period, and it only took a couple of issues. And he did pretty well, though I gave him a nervous breakdown. Graham even first worked with one of his well-known collaborators, writer Don McGregor, during his Warren days. After Warren, Graham went to Marvel in 1972, where he co-created the street-level hero, Luke Cage. Before talking about Graham's Marvel work, I'm going to cover the history of the first black superhero. It ties into what I'll cover later. While Black Panther is known as the first black superhero with superhuman abilities, there is another one who precedes him. In 1947, Philadelphia-based journalist Orrin Cromwell Evans with editors Harry T. Saylor and Bill Driscoll came together to publish the first comic with an all-black creative team. Before making his jump to comics, Evans spent the 30s as a general assignment reporter at various papers. It's noted that he was the first black reporter for the Philadelphia Record where he wrote about segregation among soldiers during World War II. Evans decided to publish comics with the hopes that he would reach a wider audience by covering social issues through comics. He brought on a few artists to produce stories with like Cooper, Cravat, and John Terrell. One of them was his own brother, George J. Evans Jr. In the pages of this comic is the debut of Lion Man, the first black superhero. That said, Lion Man's superhero outfit is… it's just a loincloth. When Jack Kirby and Stan Lee created the King of Wakanda in Fantastic Four number 52 in 1966, Black Panther was fully decked out with a costume, mythology, and hero persona. Lion Man follows a young American college student slash scientist sent to Africa to protect a mountain of uranium from thieves. It's Black Panther. It's what Black Panther ended up becoming, just without the cat suit. It's actually funny how much visual inspiration Jack Kirby took from Lion Man for Fantastic Four number 52 to 53. One of the bad guys in Lion Man is the spitting image of Ulysses Claw. While Evans wasn't able to get a second issue published, it's still a noteworthy effort that inspired future characters. There is another character featured in this comic called Ace Harlem by artist John Terrell. He's still notable, but I wouldn't call him super since he's a police detective who fights crime in Harlem. Flash forward to 1966, featuring the first appearance of Black Panther in the pages of Fantastic Four 52. Then jumping to 1972, we get the first issue and appearance of Luke Cage, Hero for Hire. Cage is the first black superhero to star in his own comic. Unlike some heroes of this time, he made his debut in his own book instead of appearing in the pages of someone else's title beforehand. The character was designed by John Romita Sr., complete with bright yellow shirt and tiara. Archie Goodwin started as the main writer, but Steve Englehart took over for a majority of the original 16-issue run. In a twist of fate, Billy Graham was paired with artist George Tuska, one of his comics influences for art duties on Cage. Some of Graham's other influences are Frank Frazetta, Al Williamson, and Bern Hogarth. The only name that appears in all 16 issues of Luke Cage Hero for Hire without fail is Billy Graham. This includes number 17 when Cage is retitled to Power Man. 
One disappointing factor is that despite Graham's involvement as an inker, penciler, writer, or co-plotter on all 16 original issues of Hero for Hire, he isn't credited as one of the co-creators of Luke Cage. Harlem's influence on Graham is apparent in these stories. In the Luke Cage comics, the Hero for Hire sets up shop in a fictional movie theater called the Gem Theater, placing him close to all the action in Harlem. Graham himself even performed in Harlem's famous Apollo Theater. According to Billy Mitchell, the official tour guide and historian for the Apollo Theater, Graham did stand up and even emceed some musical performances at the Apollo. Despite not being officially listed, Billy Graham is absolutely one of Cage's co-creators due to his ever-present role on the book. The letters page in Cage number 10 from 1973 teased Graham's next big project. Joining writer Don McGregor in the pages of Jungle Action for Black Panther's first solo series in 1974. Graham took over as regular series artist from Rich Buckler with issue number 10. So, Jungle Action. Awful title great Black Panther story usually referred to as Panther's Rage. It features T'Challa returning to Wakanda to take his home and kingdom back from the lethal Eric Killmonger. This run expanded Black Panther's foundation through its sprawling, powerful, and poetic storytelling. It's like this story explores the entire geography of Wakanda in a way that makes it feel real. At times, this series reads more like a novel than a comic. It's one of those comics that reads better collected than as separate issues. It has some gorgeous credits pages and interiors by Buckler and Graham. Klaus Janssen even inks some of Graham's pencils in certain issues. While Graham and McGregor work together at Warren, Black Panther kicks off one of their well-known extended collaborations. This jungle action run features one of Graham and McGregor's most infamous stories. After defeating Killmonger, the King of Wakanda goes to Georgia to face off against the KKK. The thing is, McGregor and Graham's story in Jungle Action number 19 to 22 is usually credited to cartoonist Jack Kirby. The big error there is that Kirby didn't even come back to work on the character he co-created until 1977, which is the first official Black Panther series slash reboot during his return to Marvel, which happened in 1975. So McGregor and Graham told the Panther going to Georgia story, then Kirby kicked off a new Panther series after the Jungle Action one ended. Kirby never had a story where Panther fought the clan, but he did tell stories about punching out other lowlifes. Luckily, McGregor and Graham teamed up again for McGregor's creator-owned series, Saber, at Eclipse Comics. In 1978, Eclipse Comics, founded by editor and publisher Dean Mullaney, published Saber, Don McGregor's creator-owned comic in collaboration with artist Paul Glacey. Saber was one of the first American graphic novels published for the direct market. However, it's more like two standard comics worth of material as opposed to a graphic novel in big bold letters. It's this dystopian story about freedom fighters fighting for love and against tyrants. A lot of trippy melodramatic themes and social commentary. In 1982, Eclipse released Saber as a series, with the first two issues reprinting the Glacey pages in color. That same year sees Billy Graham taking over as series artist with issue number three. The beauty of these Saber issues is that despite having three artists, Paul Glacey, Billy Graham, and Jose Ortiz, they weren't forced to imitate each other. When Graham took over from Glacey in number three, he was free to experiment in his own way. While Glacius' stories were more grounded, Graham injects the world with psychedelic, fluid, mind-melting energy that meshes well with McGregor's dreamlike, verbose, romantic writing. Saber was different from Black Comics characters that came before him because he wasn't a street-level character or a king. He was a romantic, swashbuckling freedom fighter that carried big guns, fought power-hungry tyrants, rode giant butterflies, and spoke with healthy amounts of poetic lyricism. When Milestone Media entered the scene in 1993 with the Dakotaverse, they created a wide range of characters by writers and artists like Dwayne McDuffie, Dennis Cowan, M.D. Bright, Christopher Priest, and others. That year, Milestone dropped four books at once. Hardware, Icon, Blood Syndicate, and Static. All of which presented new layered stories about black superheroes that hadn't been done before. 
One of Milestone's co-founders, Michael Davis, talked about how Sabre impacted him. He's written an entire editorial describing the book's effect on him and his work, which is available in the description. I should also note the impact of Black Lightning by Trevor Von Eden and Tony Isabella from DC in 1977. Since this is a Billy Graham essay, I won't talk about Jefferson Pierce as much as I'd like. Martin Luther King was invited to the White House and went to the White House to plead with John F. Kennedy for a new civil rights bill. After we see this scene, then we'll see why he was pleading for this new civil rights bill for people throughout the country, especially um, Negroes in the South. We'll see a scene with an old farmer who explains one of the things that he's grateful for Martin Luther King doing. We're going to first start off with um, Martin Luther King and John F. Kennedy in the White House. After departing Sabre with number nine in 1984, Graham became more focused on performing, writing plays, and set design. His last comics work was doing art for Power Man and Iron Fist number 114 with writer Christopher Priest. A few of Graham's plays include The Dreams of Dr. King, The Trial of Adam Clayton Jr., and another one about a pool player, Detroit Slim. According to a Facebook page run by his family, Graham has mountains of unpublished plays and concepts that he worked on. Set designing was one of his other roles, and he won an Aldeco Award for his set design work in New York Productions. He also had some film and TV roles, and apparently did stunts for the Spike Lee Malcolm X movie with Denzel. After creating a diverse body of work during his career, Billy Graham passed away in 1999 at the age of 63. I've talked about Billy Graham quite a few times over the years in my writing, videos, and send podcasts, but wanted to give him his own essay. His work deserves a lot more coverage. Also, I don't believe this is a photo of Billy Graham. It's been attributed to him for years, but this person hasn't been identified. Photos of young Billy exist, and this shirt isn't him. The full transcript for this essay is available on my website, witsandpod.com. All of my videos and information are available there as well. If it's not on my website, it's not me, except no substitutes check out the rest of my essays and spread the word. Anyway, here's to Billy Graham, someone who didn't limit himself creatively. Chaos ensues.